and it's really hard to get people from the emergency department, so we very much appreciate our colleagues from San Bernardino, so from Arrowhead Regional Medical Center. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for having us and uh, being here to share all these ideas. It's pretty impressive. I'm, a, I'm an emergency medicine guy, not an HIV guy. And so um, whenever I come to these conferences to get to see the dedication and the energy around this is really inspiring to me and I want to take that back to my partners in the ED, so thanks. Um, so we were asked to come and speak about our expanded testing program that we've implemented in the ED, uh, how we've done that and some of our challenges. So for the past three years, we've been working to meet the CDC guidelines for screening. Um, but logistically, that's, that's a big challenge. And we heard it earlier today when um, you go to an emergency department or hospital administration and bring up this idea, there's a big concern about impacting patient flow and movement through the ED. So we, we're not able to go all the way to meeting the guidelines, but what we have been able to do is to offer the test to anyone who's getting their blood drawn as part of their normal course of care in the emergency department. And that's enabled us to go from doing about 60 um, opt-in focused tests to around 2,000 opt-out non-focused screening tests a month in our emergency department. Yay. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's been great. So, so to date, um, or as of December, we've, we've done about 49,000 HIV tests over the past almost three years uh, with 445 positives. So that's just under 1%. Um, and, and Wayman here, who is our care coordinator, who will speak in a minute about the great work he's done, has been able to link 345. So about 78% of our positives to, to follow up care, which is huge. Um, so our, our, just briefly, our system, our, our EHR has an order set built into it and it's attached to all of the chief complaint based sets that pop up for the providers. So the providers have those orders right in front of them. Um, they advise the patient that they're going to do this test and allow the patient the opportunity to opt out. And as long as the patient doesn't, the test gets ordered. Um, nurse draws an extra tube of blood when the patient has their blood drawn and that's sent to the lab to do this. We do all the testing on site, including confirmatory and um, viral loads. So that happens within about an hour and a half. We have our answer back, um, at least preliminarily and we're able to inform the patient in the ED if they're still there. If they're not there, then of course we make contact with them and Wayman will call them and have them come back. We have a process by which we can consult him electronically through the computer. He's there business hours um, and more, but um, those, those print out to his desk in a secure printer where he can pick those up on his next business or work day. Um, and he's had great, great success in, in linking those folks. Um, with all that being said, you know, we're drawing about 32, 3,400 unique patients' blood a month. And as I said, we're doing about 2,000 tests. So we still have some opportunity for improvement there to get to 100% of all of our blood drawns. Most of that is due to provider bias. Um, whether or not the, the provider thinks it's necessary or not, and still not moving all the way to full um, opt-out non-targeted screening because of that. So we're working hard with education. And one of the interesting things about um, this process that's actually enabling us to change their minds is over this period of time, we've had seven acute cases identified in the ED and none of those patients were identified in the ED. They were all discharged home with some cough or URI or other viral illness type diagnosis. So had they not been screened, they would have never known. Right. And we were able to get most of them back and get them established into care very quickly. Um, but that's the kind of thing that enables you to change an emergency medicine provider's mindset is when they realize they screwed up and sent somebody home that had they just done universal screening, we could have caught that in, in these seven people we were able to. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just to uh, add on to what Dennis was saying, um, again, my name is Wayman Edwards. Um, I started off uh, as a Navy corpsman, uh, so it's really nice to see uh, the public health officers in the room today. It's been a little too long for me, so I greatly appreciate your attendance and your support and recommendations. Um, I, uh, after being in the United States Navy, I served in a private practice for a number of years and found my way to public health in Riverside County. 
uh, when I was there in Riverside County, I helped to pioneer after the uh, bridge, former bridge program here in the state of California was dismantled into what is now the HIV care program, thus helping them to pioneer their care program in public health. So I'm a strong proponent of the principles and the foundations that we teach and practice through public health. Um, however, um, with every triumph, right, there's always some reason to do better. And so in Riverside County, um, things uh, began to plateau a great deal because there we see a lot of transient patients and clients going not just from county to county uh, between Riverside and San Bernardino, but also coming from the Bay Area, coming from Los Angeles, San Diego, all many looking for housing, looking for a better life, looking for ways to feed themselves, get high, do whatever it is that they do. And so our work, obviously, as many of you already know, is quite daunting. Um, but my goal, uh, once I was able to meet Dr. Tankersley, was to uh, join forces with him because his goal was quite innovative, as you already know, uh, and that's to conduct this type of a program through the emergency room. Um, because in the emergency room, this is the care that most people will, you know, come in contact with more than, you know, the majority of others who do have health care insurance. So um, at that uh, point, my goal is to meet those patients in real time. If not, I try to make contact with them uh, within days. But obviously, due to my caseload, sometimes that may not occur. However, when I do make contact with those clients, uh, my goal uh, you know, I'm always refining um, this statement, uh, but more or less what I try to accomplish is a high impact precision trauma informed care model. Um, it's rooted in health education, medical case management, cultural competency. I cannot stress that enough. Uh, client centered counseling, and it's all designed to be able to meet the client where they are to employ these disease intervention techniques. Um, one of the uh, greatest challenges that I deal with every day had me, um, you know, constantly, I'm always reading. I'm an avid reader. Anything I can get my hands on, I'm constantly reading. So, in honor of Dr. King's holiday, uh, about a week and a half ago, I just happened to be reviewing uh, his last speech before his assassination. And I'm not certain how many people in the room, but I'm sure many of you recall that that speech was basically the precept to what we are talking about as far as social determinants of health. And Dr. King talked about the three evils that our society faces. Um, I think they've expanded to some degree, but I'm just going to cite four, racism, poverty, war, and economic exploitation. And here we are in 2020, and we are seeing what it does when we do not address these issues. I was mentioning to our uh, CDC um, uh, representatives about uh, us being able to join forces, because I'm in the streets. I'm in the homeless shelters. I'm in the, you know, under bridges. I'm, I'm, I'm where the problems exist. And because I only have one minute, I'm just going to say this briefly, but until we can change our posture and change our positions to be able to meet these clients where they are, we will not meet this goal to end this epidemic. I still talk to many patients. Please, thank you. Please, please. I, I talk to patients every day, African-American patients every day about getting into care. And one of their biggest fears, they don't want to be another Tuskegee experiment. So how do we, you know, engage that population if we're not willing to have that conversation? So what I've done is I have those conversations, you see, and this is just the beginning steps to be able to open these patients' minds and thoughts. And by doing so, I take on the mantle of the public health apparatus. I take on the mantle of pharmaceutical companies who are you know, willing to donate billions of dollars to this cause. I take on each and every one of your programs to show them that there is a different outcome. I join, I ask you all to join me in doing that when you get back to work. Thank you. Thank so you.